So I'd like to go back to my intro where I stated that both science and art make the invisible visible. And I've heard that many times from in many kind of settings in both science and art. And um, it's something that is, strikes me. Um, so I guess just the question to each of you, how, how is that expressed for, for you, um, either in your writing or, in, or visually? Um. Well, Paul Clay famously said, uh, art makes the invisible visible. Yeah. Oh, I need to turn it on. Or, yeah. Thank you. Hello? Is it better now? Yeah. OK. So Paul Clay famously said uh, one of the, the goals of art, or the reasons for doing it, was to render the invisible visible. And I think. Um, Maybe in relation to that and the fact that I have trouble recalling my dreams when I wake up is the reason why my paintings look the way they do. Mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm, I'm actively trying to um, manifest and make something I haven't seen before um, and, and very, very consciously. And maybe it's uh, me making up for the dreams, which most of my dreams, uh, which I mean, I do dream and I remember them. They're often very quotidian. They're every day kind of like taking out the garbage and, uh, or they're just terrifying nightmares. Um, and those I tend to remember. And I have uh, written some of those down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, from the science perspective, I mean, obviously, if you, broadly, if you're talking about science, most science is studying things at a level where we can't directly perceive them with, with our senses. I mean, l like Kekulé trying to visualize the structure of benzene. Now we actually do have electron microscopes where you could just peer in at a molecule and see its structure. But in his day, that had to be done completely abstractly. So I mean, I think that's true of most most science, but in studying dreams, it may be a bit more like art that one is trying to take a very vivid subjective experience and even visual experience that's only in your own head and convey it to someone else. I mean, I, I think that's what a lot of dream art is about, but that's kind of what dream researchers are doing. I mean, our own dreams are certainly not invisible to us unless it's a memory issue. They're very vividly there, but no one else can see them. And so dream researchers are kind of trying to study what that's about and characterize across dreams and let people know facts about other people's right. dreams. So that seems that that's a thing that kind of, you know, ups, you know, that you're obsessed with or that motivates you. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that kind of touches on for me, and I, I think, Sean, you talked about it more than Deirdre, but this idea of language or that it's not mm -hmm. linguistic. Yeah moment, either of like wonder or like the dream you just had. Mm -hmm. But then we need to we need to kind of tell the story. You know, we need to say it in some way so that the language is always failing in a certain way. So maybe, you know, you've written a whole book of trying to get the language to not fail, to, to describe. Um, so that's, I think, um, that seems like really interesting and something that you're always trying to like make manifest in some way. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think when it comes to um, language, have, living with two little creatures, little people in the house, uh, it's been really fascinating as I've been working and studying and chasing this wonder uh, research around. Um, I think it, it, as adults, we, we, we know so much already. And when I'm looking at my kids, um, they don't have as big of a vo vocabulary or world experience, and they don't know things. And so I think that's why you know, a sense of wonder is often the province of, of youth. And um, you know, they, they can see something happen. It's not just an object, but it can be an event or some kind of thing. And they have no means of getting from A to B in terms of understanding that. Mm -hmm. So they insert something, or they just let that wash over them. So there's no indexical kind of reference for them uh, back to language. And I think as adults, one of the things that uh, Edith Cobb said, and I don't know if the Edith Cobb 
slide showed up. I didn't notice it. Uh, Edith Cobb is this really interesting woman that wrote The Ecology of Imagination and Childhood, who talks a lot about wonder. She wrote this in the 40s or 50s. Uh, it's the only book she ever wrote. And um, she, it was um, uh, in it, she talks about, uh, it's mostly about children, but she talks about for adults, you have to te develop a technique. You have to, a way of re-engaging the world so that you can notice things again. And uh, it's a really fantastic quote that I have in, in my essay in the book. And um, uh, so, so it reminds me of, um, um, this is getting back to the language. Yeah. So it idea. seems yeah. something that I think about a lot, which is it's sort of our jobs as mm -hmm. artists, writers, et cetera, to, um, help people pay attention to the things that they don't notice. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, like, yeah. um, like everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, you know, um, it's just, um, and I think, you know, my, my interest, my interest in uh, having created Catalyst Conversations is, is to do this so mm -hmm. that you also, as a, as, a, or as a researcher, you're also trying to get people to pay attention to, to you know, whatever the subject. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, it, this book, Committee of Sleep, where, you've, where you have interviewed artists and scientists and writers um, and sort of seeing what, what kind of bubbles to, to the surface for, for each of them and then to kind of compare them. I, I, was, um, I have just finished the book today and um, I was fascinated by your uh, description of people who are not well and who anticipate, like, their cancer or, or throat, uh, you know, thyroid problems. Um, so I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I mean, in the medical chapter, there, there are some examples of doctors dreaming new treatment right. solution, kind of, of very much like the sciency. But there are a lot of examples of dreams that alerted somebody to having some medical condition. Um, and I frankly don't particularly believe in psychic dreams, um, but there's a, there's a lot of, of opinions on both sides of that. But I, I definitely think that even some of the ones that are often sort of quoted as psychic, it strikes me how often they are kind of the longer term illnesses, not the things that really farm in 24 hours, but they're things like cancer and neurological conditions. Oliver Sacks has this wonderful paper where he writes about dreams that patients had prodromally to developing various disorders. Um, but he definitely thinks this is their nervous system sensing something that is only going to be clinically manifest in a few days. And a lot of my examples in that book are, are cancer, where somebody dreams either very metaphoric, cancer-like things, or a character tells them that they have cancer and they be better go to the doctor right now. And, you know, our immune system knows we have cancer before we do, even if it's not effectively fighting it, it's forming antibodies, you know, tumors are pressing on nerves. And I think that that dreams are a state where we, we don't have to pay any attention to any sensory input from the outside so that sometimes body sensations that we're not noticing at other times come through. And it's, it's not an especially frequent dream content, but it's, it's just part of that. Just like our waking thought is about everything, our dreaming mind really seems to be going everywhere, including some very practical places. So um, uh, probably everyone noticed that uh, Sarah um, organized the exhibition by various topics, and um, Sean's piece is in mutation. And so you've also talked about with, with us and then this evening about the grotesque and the fantastic mm -hmm. and the horrible and so on, the uncanny. So I was just um, wondering if you could expound on that. I'm happy to be in the mutation category, <laughs> very much so. Um, I, I, um, just to expand on the ideas in, generally about mm -hmm. mutation, I mean, I think um, uh, for for me, whenever I'm, I'm making work, it's always about uh, 
finding, finding a moment where the, the work leaves what I understand it to be, or it's more than or different than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. It's something other. It's other than me. And at that moment, I might, I might have a mini, small sense of wonder about it, not about my ability to make it, but that something surfaced there that I didn't expect. And in talking about hypnagogic um, uh, moments, and I love that thing about Dali, because this is one, in, in having our conversation this summer, I was really thinking about, like, whoa, when's the last time that dreams or, or were really present in my studio? Mm. And it, it actually was uh, uh, when I was in, I had an artist residency at Bemis in Omaha, Nebraska. And there you have these huge warehouse, um, I, I think it's changed, but at the time it was a huge warehouse space. And your room was in with your studio. So when I would fall asleep, I would fall asleep laying down, looking at the paintings on the opposite wall there, because there was nothing else in the way. And I started realizing that right at that moment that I started to vanish, I started to come up with solutions to things. So I started at that time, this was way back, a long time ago in the 90s, um, early 90s, I started to actively do that during the day in the studio. And in fact, this whole uh, conversation and program has inspired me. Uh, I just bought a cot <laughs> for my studio. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'll have to do it like in a lobster claw or something like that in Maine. Um, but but that that really that really allowed me to see things. And it has to. And I, I was thinking about it driving down. It always has to be me laying down because if I'm sitting up in my comfy chair, which I have in the studio, and I nod off, um, especially at home with kids. Um, I wake up and the picture is still in the orientation to which I'm familiar with. But if I'm laying sideways and that happens, I, I'm seeing it differently. And as I'm falling asleep, I can't understand this thing that I just made. So that's kind of, um, um, th that's a really good thing that's come out of this is the cot <laughs> and, 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 really and, and the coin. I use a coin. And you keep alluding to your kids and yeah. they're having more wonder, but I bet they have more dream recall too. Children do yeah. on average. And some, some painters paint other people's dreams. Tabitha paints other people's yeah. flying dreams, but um, the uh, Avatar Blue people came from the director screenwriter's mother's dream right. about right. about these odd blue people right. uh, that she did. Yeah, I, I actually saw that work by Tabitha years mm -hmm. ago. And, and, it, and I was thinking about uh, the last image you showed of Jasper John's flag and, and how, how... It's still up there. It's my least favorite image in my slides and it's, it's up there for the rest. Well, he can, he's definitely, he can handle it. <laughs> um, to have John's up there, uh, that, that large is appropriate. Um, I, I think, you know, for, for him, um, uh, you were mentioning like you aren't, it's surprising that maybe the flag would be out of, come out of the dream, but I was thinking that for John's, I think what it, what it did was it sparked the right, it opened the door. It, his, that particular dream opened the door to the right direction when you have a multitude of different pathways you can take as an artist, which can be completely overwhelming. Um, and in fact, uh, according to the, the biography that I know of John's, uh, after that dream and this flag, he destroyed every other work he, he had m ever made. Yes. You know, he, he, yeah. And so, I mean, I think that that's, you know, the, the effect of a dream can be uh, almost visionary, or it can just sort of point to the right thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in John's case, I think it's really fascinating that after that, he just got rid of everything. He wanted a clean story. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's an amazing story. It just, it's almost more like some of the stories from other professions sure. where very, very practical things come out of dreams or general patent dream battle plans. It's not just sort of nicey stuff that, that comes out of dreams. Um, but it's just... It's just that my own dreams look so much more like the surrealists and like Dolly is saying, you know, the key wakes him up from 
and I don't dream about static big flags, but that doesn't mean that no one could. He right. did. So um, I'm going to ask like one more question among the three of us, then maybe we have about five minutes for audience participation. So I was going to ask you both about your own dreams, which you have both already answered. And I was delighted to see that you put up that image of your own dream or dream image. Um, so. <coughs> Yeah, I guess I'm still asking, um, as a dream researcher, that you must be sort of, you must spend a lot of, or that you're kind of vigilant about your own dreams and paying attention to what you're dreaming, and that you dream about dreams. All, all, but, all but one dream researcher I've ever talked to about this says that, that their own dreams were always unusually vivid, they had higher than average dream recall. I have one friend who says just the most interesting professor at his school was running the dream lab. But mostly it's kind of your own dreams that, that get you interested in it. So mine have always been very vivid and perhaps more surreal than usual. But yeah, once I started really studying dreams, I mean, I have dreams where characters come and tell me about some dream theory that I don't know about yet, or I'm leading a group. Actually, when I'm trying to have lucid dreams and I tell myself that I want to realize what I'm dreaming, that provokes the most of these dream references and dreams that, that I don't necessarily get lucid from. I, I had a dream where I was leading a, like a therapy group. I'm also a clinical psychologist, and everybody was dozing off and closing their eyes, and I could see their eyes moving really rapidly under their lids, which is the signal for the dreaming state of sleep. And I'm thinking, oh, I know that means something. What does that mean? Um, or dreams where I'll dream something and I'll have a false awakening and think that I've woken up and I'll be interpreting my dream to someone else or I'll be telling it to someone who interprets it to me. And the more you study the dreams, I think the more of those kind of dream referential things. Those came along after I was a professional, but very vivid dreams uh, sort of my whole life. So yeah, we're kind of opposites on on that. Although you seem to ha you seem in your waking state to have all kinds of states of consciousness. I'd like to yeah happens awake. So, uh, I was wondering if any of the audience has a question. And Laura, should I give the person the mic? No. Okay. Uh, so Pat. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you. So. So I, I'm a visual artist, I'm a very vivid dreamer, but I'm less interested in trying to whatever paint or draw my own dreams, um, and more interested in this idea, kind of we almost just refer to these like waking states of consciousness, where you almost like you start to create work around the process of dreaming, like you kind of go to that place. And so I find that it's really related to imagination. So I was kind of curious your ideas on the relationship between dream, like the sleeping, and the waking imagination. Hmm. Um, well, for me, that's where um, I, uh, I started thinking about conditions of wonder. I mean, other conditions of the inexplicable, where you, you can't, you know, something spooky, where you can't pinpoint something. And, and I think that, that that diagram that I have up there is actually version six. And every time I teach the course, it shifts and it changes. But I think that's the neighborhood of wonder. And, um, and of course, horror is very different than something, than beauty or, um, and I think that what in, in the waking state that can align your, that can align you a little bit more closely with maybe the reason or the source or or um, the next action to take. I mean, as a lot of people have these wonder moments and see small things every day, and they just let them go. Right. That's and what it's would our job to our job to uh, right, alert people? To right. And what would happen if if you if you hung on to that, but. Uh, you realize, like, wow, this is more in, in sort of the realm of the marvelous. You know, it's like a marvelous object versus uh, something that's completely sublime, like, you know, uh, an extraordinary sunset on top of Cadillac Mountain. And I, I have one little thing to say to that, which is um, I, in interviewing um, visual artists, 
uh, I was really struck at how many of them have waking imagery that does seem very much like nighttime dreams, whereas most people don't. I, I never heard this from, from any scientist or even any writer, but I would ask people if they used their dreams in their work, they'd start, artists would start telling me a dream, and then somewhere in the dream, they would mention, and I was walking along and I was dreaming blah blah, and I'd be like, kind of, wait a minute, do you mean this was a night where were you walking in your dream? Or, and and they'd, they'd be telling me what I would call a daydream. Um, but but they would say they just didn't make any distinction because they had waking dreams that seemed just like nighttime dreams. And I didn't hear that from any other profession, and I just heard it repeatedly from, from artists. So that, that's why I think that, like Sean not recalling, dreams may not be missing quite the same thing that, that other non-dream recallers, because I, I think waking imagery may be more like that for more visual artists. Yeah. Um, one of the th aspects that I haven't heard you talk about, which in my dreams they're all spatial. Mm -hmm. I'm flying, or I'm going under, or they are very, uh, they sort of put me into spaces. And Susan Heller, I don't know if you know her work, Deirdre, but She's done a lot of work with um, students with mapping their dreams. And the maps become extraordinary too. So I'm just wondering if you've sort of uh, put any of your research in, into space, how the space and dreams. Hmm. Um, actually, none of my, my own research tends to be on post-traumatic nightmares and interventions with them and lucid dreams occurring naturally and ways to produce those. And none of my own research is on that per se. Um, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with, I mean, many of the kind of drawing your dreams more as dream interpretation than as trying to create art are emphasizing that kind of, of space. Um, Robbie Baznak, who's a Jungian analyst I know pretty well, who's written a bunch of dream books. He has a kind of dream re-entry that instead of focusing on the emotions and kind of seeing things once you're back in the dream, the way many of the Jungian dream re-entries would go, Robbie's version is very much about feeling the space and sensing how far away characters or even walls are and noticing any kinesthetic sensations as you're moving. It's, it's much less visual. But basically, and again, this is more other people's research, seems to show that, that vision is the sense that's most dominant, but then kinesthetic body movement and essentially sense of space is second. They're both way ahead of auditory, which is way ahead of smell and, and other things. So yeah, I think we're very aware of spatial being an important secondary, but literally, no, personally, none of my research is specifically around that. Maybe time for one more, if anybody has a question or thought. She's asking about sleep paralysis. Right, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, it, I mean it's very dream related. It um, people with the disorder of narcolepsy, in addition to having sleep attacks, have lots of instances of sleep paralysis, and it can even it can just be the paralysis or very often it's accompanied by what they call hypnagogic hallucinations where you're, you're, you feel like you've woken up. Um, in simple sleep paralysis, you just can't move. You can usually open your eyes and see the room, but you can't move. But with the hypnagogic hallucinations that often come, you basically see your room, but you see something else that's not there. Sometimes you know it's continuous with a dream you've just been having, that, that that witch that was chasing you in the dream is now in your room, even though you see the rest of your room. And it's definitely the EEGs of people having that look, they're, they're always in dreaming sleep right before it happens, and basically some brain areas are waking up and others aren't, and you're, you're paralyzed during rapid eye movement sleep, 
so that you won't act out all your dreams. And the paralysis is, is that area failing to, to wake up and, and switch modalities. But if your secondary visual cortex doesn't calm down immediately when other areas are awake, that's when you keep seeing things from. So, so it is, your mind is partly still dreaming and partly awake. And it's very scary for most people, although some people are prone to it, find that they can use it kind of like a lucid dream if they go, oh yes, this is sleep paralysis, and I would rather be seeing something wondrous than horrible right now, that they can do things that lucid dreamers can do. So um, we're running a little late, so I want to uh, kind of close here and thank Deidre and uh, Sean so much for a great conversation. And we could probably keep doing this for a long time. And thank you so much for, for <laughs> making like, this happen. Thank you.